If a console was released within the past few years, chances are there's an emulator out there for it. Some may only succeed in booting up, some may only be able to play a small portion of commercial games, but most emulators you see out there run most games from a console's entire library, sometimes better than the original hardware. Obviously, emulators are an extremely important part of video game preservation. As the system gets older, a working unit gets harder and harder to get your hands on, especially if it wasn't a very popular system to begin with. Seriously, have you ever looked at the prices for a working Vectrex? Yikes. But not every emulator developer is in it for the sake of preservation or accuracy. Every once in a while you'll see a closed source commercial emulator. These usually have one goal in mind, run popular games well enough that people buy it. It's definitely not something you see very often anymore, probably because of the amazing open source emulators we have now, but another big reason for it is probably from fear of getting the big companies angry and getting involved in a messy legal case. Such was the fate of Bleem Inc., a now defunct company that created this surprisingly unknown Bleemcast. Bleemcast is a PS1 emulator for the Sega Dreamcast that, according to their website, looked and played PlayStation games better than the system they were designed for. Well, I wanted to know how true this claim was, and if it was true, I wanted to know exactly how it was able to accomplish something so incredible. So that's what we're going to look into today. Welcome to Tech Rules. Before we start, I want to give a huge thanks to Swagbucks for sponsoring today's video. Swagbucks is a service that lets you earn cash and gift cards just by doing simple things like taking surveys, watching videos, playing games, that kind of stuff. The activities you do earn you points toward things like an iTunes gift card, which is actually what I'm doing because every app on their store is like 99 cents. This thing will last me a very long time. But if iTunes isn't your thing, no big deal. You can get cards for Amazon, eBay, Walmart, Starbucks, seriously, just take a look. I guarantee you'll find something you like. And if you sign up using the link in the description, you'll get $5 for free. You can't beat free. Anyway, on to the video. Before we get into what Bleem software does, let's talk a little about what Bleem is. Bleem Inc., often just called Bleem, is the creator of, well, Bleem, which was supposedly a surprisingly good PS1 emulator released in 1999, well within the PS1's lifespan. What does Bleem stand for? I have no idea. One of the first statements on their website reads, Before you ask, only Randy, the programmer, knows what Bleem means, and he ain't telling. But according to the people who worked with Randy, it probably wasn't anything pleasant. More importantly though, this was a commercial emulator, and while it did have an impressively high compatibility rating, it only worked on very specific hardware. I would love to show you the emulator in action, but I don't have any actual hardware readily accessible that I could have shown it on. But that's okay. Their PC emulator is not what I wanted to focus on. Let's talk about Bleemcast, or as it's sometimes called, Bleem for the Dreamcast. This was a commercial emulator too, but it was released a little differently. Instead of just releasing the emulator and letting you run whatever game you wanted, Bleemcast was going to be released in packs, and each pack would run a huge selection of games. Obviously, those games weren't included with Bleemcast, you had to buy them yourself, but each pack gave you access to different PS1 games to play on your Dreamcast. However, they underestimated the amount of testing that would have gone into doing this. The thing about releasing an emulator like this is the games advertised are expected to be 100% playable all the way to the end. On top of this, Bleem themselves seemed to have a very high standard for their emulator and wanted every game to run flawlessly without bugs or slowdowns. It quickly became apparent that releasing Bleemcast like this would require countless years of development and really wasn't worth it at the end of the day. What they chose to do instead was to release a Bleemcast disc of every individual game for a lower price than the packs would have been. This decision probably seems a little weird. If you want to buy a PS1 game specifically to play on your Dreamcast, you have to buy the PS1 game and and the corresponding Bleemcast disc, but it was still cheaper than buying a PS1 if you only wanted to play a couple of its exclusives. As far as its performance, well, you'd have to forgive me for being a little skeptical, especially since their website talked all about the graphic improvements, but nothing about how well the game ran. Allow me to explain my skepticism. Emulating a game takes much more power from a machine than simply running one. Say you just ran a normal game on your PC. The greatly simplified way this works is the game sends instructions to your computer's hardware. These instructions tell the computer exactly how the game should behave, how the graphics and sound should be, and so on. As long as your computer is powerful enough to process these instructions in time, the game should work fine. Now, if you were to emulate a game on your PC, 
that would be a different story. The game's set of instructions weren't designed for your PC, they were designed for whatever system it was supposed to run off of. An emulator's job is to pretend to be that original hardware and translate those instructions into something your PC can actually understand. Now the PC has extra work to do. It has to quickly translate the game's complex instructions using the emulator's own set of instructions, and then it has to run those newly translated instructions, and it has to do all of this in the same amount of time it would normally take a PC game to, well, just run. Suddenly it's a lot more work for the same result. This extra work is called overhead. The more complex the emulator game and its instructions are, the more overhead you have, and the harder it is to run the game. Because of this, the system you're emulating the game on often has to be exponentially more powerful than the system it was originally designed for. That's not to say the Dreamcast isn't more powerful than the PlayStation, by all means it is. But is it really powerful enough to emulate a system released only four years before? Naturally, I needed to see the performance for myself, so after some searching on eBay, I managed to get my hands on some Dreamcast games to try out. Now, this video is focused on the technology behind the Bleemcast and not reviewing it, so I'll try to be brief and just go over the interesting parts. For one, the cases have very tongue-in-cheek writing, which, after seeing their website, I wasn't really surprised by. Bleem is not under license from, affiliated with, or otherwise kissing up to Sony, Sega, or anybody else. And we like it that way. Even the fine print of this case is full of snarky quips. The inside of the jewel cases actually have a second space for a disc. This is neat, since you can put your PlayStation game in here and keep everything you need to play in one place. However, this is a little weird for the case of Metal Gear Solid, which is so dummy thick that it's shipped with two discs. I guess one of those is staying out. Using Blinkcast was simple. You insert the Blinkcast disc for the game you want to play, and when prompted, you swap discs to the actual game. As for performance, well, I expected something based on how highly they praise their product on their website, but what I didn't expect was for the games to run just as flawlessly as they had claimed. Like, I thought a lot of what they were saying was just hyping their own product up, but to their credit, the games run at full speed and rarely ever slow down. In fact, notice how I've been mostly showing the same three games? Yeah, you probably already figured it out, but that's footage directly from my Dreamcast. Now, there is very minor slowdown from time to time, but you rarely ever notice it. In fact, there's a slowdown I saw happen consistently in Metal Gear Solid, and I didn't even notice, because it just seems like a natural pause in the song. Impressive streak. Impressive streak. As far as the rest of the gameplay goes, the controls are remapped in each game to be as comfortable as possible. Apparently, you could even use a Dreamcast steering wheel in Gran Turismo. Saving's pretty straightforward, too. The VMU in your controller's first slot functions as the PS1 Slot 1 memory card. The only drawback, though, is it needs to format your memory card in the Dreamcast's own format. That means you can't have normal Dreamcast save files on the same memory card you keep your Dreamcast save files. But the newly formatted memory card will work for all the Dreamcast games so that's nice. Also, they weren't lying about graphical improvements. Not only do the added anti-aliasing and filtering look really nice, but the resolution itself is vastly superior to the PS1s. These games look better here than they do on PS2, in my opinion. Alright, I'm done gushing. Now that we know that Bleemcast works well, we can focus on what I was really interested in figuring out. How does this thing even work? Coming into this, I had three questions. The first one had to do with how the Bleemcast even runs on a Dreamcast at all, despite the fact it's clearly not licensed by Sega. I'll explain why that's surprising in a second. After answering that, I wanted to know how it managed to run these PlayStation games at full speed. Sure, extensive coding and testing for specifically one game helps, but it was still incredibly baffling to me that the coders at Bleem managed to pull this off. And my last question isn't really a technical question, but I was still really curious to know exactly how legal or illegal this was. Thankfully, after some research and some information head programmer Randy Linden himself gave out on the DC Emulation Forum, I think I can decently answer all these questions. Now, some of you may be wondering what I mean by the first question. After all, bootleg video games date back to well before the release of the Dreamcast, and there's not exactly a law that says you have to go through Sega if you want to release something that functions on a Dreamcast. All you would need to do is somehow bypass whatever copy protection the Dreamcast uses for its CDs. Well, that's the thing. When designing the Dreamcast, Sega decided to use the very aggressive copy protection method of, well, not using CDs at all. Yeah, instead of putting its games on CD-ROMs like most disc-based consoles at the time, Dreamcast games are stored on GD-ROMs. GD-ROM is short for Gigabyte Disk Read-Only Memory, 
fittingly named due to the fact that you could store a gigabyte of data on them. More importantly though, it wasn't exactly something that was easily accessible, considering this format was designed by Yamaha exclusively for Dreamcast games. As a consumer or small company, you wouldn't really have been able to get your hands on a way to mass produce GD-ROMs without going through Sega. So assuming that Dreamcast isn't a GD-ROM, how is it running on the Dreamcast? Well, I had a pretty good guess starting out, and when the discs came in, the cover confirmed it. Works with any mil CD compatible Dreamcast. That tells me everything I need to know. Let me explain what Mill CD was. It seems that nobody was really sure what it stood for, but the popular answer was Music Interactive Live CD. It was supposed to be an enhanced music disc that, at first glance, just seemed like another CD that worked fine on your average CD player, but pop it in your Dreamcast and it unlocked extra features. From what I've read, they could give you access to music videos, navigational menus, and certain internet features. I know that's really vague, and I would love to tell you more about them, but Mill CD was a colossal failure. Apparently only 8 kinds of Mill CDs were ever made, and they were all released in Japan. As you can imagine, these things are very rare and horrendously expensive, but what the Mill CDs themselves did isn't very important anyway. The technology itself is the interesting part. After all, it uses CD-ROMs. That's the perfect entry point. This was what made it possible for hackers to eventually figure out how to make their own Mill CDs and completely bust the system security wide open. Sure, most uses of Mill CD were for piracy, but it was perfectly possible to use it to make homebrew for the Dreamcast 2. It's the reason the Dreamcast had such a thriving homebrew scene. Anyway, mystery solved, Dreamcast works because it takes advantage of the Mill CD format. Okay, now for the second question. How is it running at full speed? This one I won't be able to explain as well as the last one. For legal reasons, the original Bleem crew refused to talk about how Bleemcast worked, only giving vague answers from time to time. Here's what I do know. A big reason that Bleemcast ran so well was because it was coded in assembly, which is an extremely low-level programming language. I think the best way to explain what that is would be to compare it to a high-level language like C++. C++ is a powerful language because of how many complex actions it can perform with minimal lines of code. In context, in contrast, assembly is the exact opposite. It's painfully specific, it takes forever, and if you work with someone who writes code in assembly for a living, chances are you don't appreciate them enough. So if it's so awful, why is Blinkcast written in it? Answer: Control. Assembly, in a lot of ways, lets you communicate with the system's hardware in ways high-level languages couldn't dream of. Remember how I talked about overhead being a huge issue with emulation? If a particularly smart programmer has access to such a specific language, they would be able to massively manage and reduce that overhead by taking advantage of the hardware's extremely specific quirks and strengths. And trust me, there aren't many ways you can get more specific than writing a program in assembly. Interestingly enough, the original Bleem emulator was coded in the same language, but using the information we just talked about, we can infer that they probably don't share too much code. After all, the hardware between a PC and a Dreamcast are vastly different, and because of that, porting a program made in such a low-level language would not be worth the effort by a long shot. That being said, the knowledge of the PlayStation the programmers gained from working on Bleem was probably very helpful for creating Bleemcast. And considering they managed to pull this off, it's safe to say they were the real deal. Now for the final question. Was it legal? Well, Sony didn't seem to think so, because they decided to take Bleem to court over their emulators. And I just want to read off this huge list of Sony's claims real quick. Take a listen. Copyright infringement by the emulator's code. Copyright infringement over the use of screenshots on their cases in marketing. Reverse palming off of Sony's intellectual property. Dilution of its intellectual property. Misappropriation of trade secrets. False advertising over something, an unfair competition for the PlayStation. Now, this isn't law rules, so I won't go over all of that, but you know what? Sony didn't win a single one. All of their alleged copyright infringement was either completely false or protected under fair use, and it was decided that what Bleem was doing was perfectly legal. So I guess that answers that question. Now that you know a little more about Bleemcast, I bet you're wondering what other games were released for it. Well, I'm sorry to say that these three are it. Sure, Bleem won in court, but the legal fees required to fight Sony was nothing short of devastating, and the company could no longer stay afloat. In November 2001, Bleem's website was updated to simply show this image. It truly is a shame that we didn't get to see more of what Bleemcast could do. A beta disc of Bleem was leaked much later down the line, but it was also a build created very early in development. It didn't run very well. I've tried to mess with my Bleemcast discs to get them to load other games, but it has some aggressive copy protection I can't get past. I'm not too worried about it though. Even if I somehow did, I doubt I could get anything interesting to happen with it. These programmers were simply too devious to make it that easy. Hey, thanks for checking the video out. 
Hopefully learning about Bleem's history and the more technical details was interesting. This video was supported by patrons like Jombo, Squeakiel, and all these names you see on screen. If you want to support the show too, feel free to check out my Patreon below. Thanks for watching, and as always, I hope you keep an eye out for more tech rules.